Hello and welcome to the 211th meeting of the National Council on the Arts. Please note that this meeting is being recorded. The recording will be available on demand and on our website, arts.gov. ASL interpretation and closed captioning are also available for the duration of the meeting. You can enable closed captions by clicking on the closed caption icon on the bottom of your screen. Friends, please welcome the Chair of the National Endowment for the Arts, Dr. Maria Rosario Jackson. Good morning. The 211th meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now in session. I'm Maria Rosario Jackson, Chair of the National Endowment for the Arts. I'm a woman with dark curly hair. I'm wearing a black sweater. Welcome members of the National Council on the Arts, arts leaders, NEA staff, and members of the public. Happy National Arts and Humanities Month, and thank you for making time to be with us today. For the record, our National Council on the Arts members joining us virtually today are Ishmael Ahmed of Michigan, Bita Becker of Navajo Nation, Bruce Carter of Florida, Gretchen Davidson of Michigan, Aaron Dworkin of Michigan, Camila Forbes of New York, Deepa Gupta of Illinois, Paul Holtz of Maine, Emil Kang of New York, Waskar Medina of Kansas, Christopher Morgan of Hawaii, Fiona Whelan Prine of Tennessee, Jake Shimabukuro of Hawaii, Connie Williams of Pennsylvania, and Michael Lombardo of California. Established by Congress in 1965, the National Endowment for the Arts is an independent federal agency charged with making the arts available to all Americans. By advancing equitable opportunities for arts participation and practice, the NEA fosters and sustains an environment in which the arts benefit everyone in the United States. We are a funder, a grant maker, and also a national resource that works to help bolster arts, design, and culture in all communities. The National Council on the Arts advises on agency policies, programs, and grants. For our first order of business, can I get a motion to approve the minutes of the June 2023 Council meeting? So moved. Second. Seconded. Any opposed? Thank you. Now, I would like to introduce Ayana Hudson, Chief Strategy, Programs and Engagement Officer at the NEA. Thank you, Chair Jackson, and good morning. I'm an African-American woman with long, um, shoulder-length black hair and bangs. I'm wearing glasses and a white, red, and black shirt with a black sweater. Council members, we will proceed with the application review section of the agenda. The tally of the votes will be announced at the end of today's session. The council will be voting by ballot today on award recommendations totaling more than $38.2 million in three funding areas, grants for arts projects, creative writing fellowships, and national initiatives. These funding recommendations are found in the corresponding sections of the council book. For your vote to be tallied, you must be present at the time of the motion, discussion, and vote. Council members, you must email your votes to Kim Jefferson in this category immediately at the conclusion of this part of the meeting. Council members' affiliations are recorded in the council book and attached to your ballots, and each member has been provided an opportunity to update this information prior to the meeting. Council members are recorded as not voting on applications with which they are affiliated. This list becomes part of the agency's official record. May I have a motion to consider the recommended grants and rejections under grants for arts projects, creative writing fellowships, and national initiatives in the council book? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Now we'll summarize the funding areas on which you will be voting. Grants for arts projects or GAP is the largest grants program of the National Endowment for the Arts, providing comprehensive and expansive funding opportunities for communities. Through project-based funding, the program supports opportunities for public engagement with the arts and arts education, for the integration of the arts with strategies promoting the health and well-being of people and communities, 
and for the improvement of overall capacity and capabilities within the arts sector. The agency welcomes applications from a variety of eligible organizations, nonprofit organizations, units of state and local government, and federally recognized tribal communities or tribes, including first-time applicants, organizations serving communities of all sizes, including rural and urban areas, and from organizations with small and medium or large operating budgets. NEA is committed to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and fostering mutual respect for the diverse beliefs and values of all individuals and groups. We encourage projects that address any of the following. Elevate artists is integral and essential to a healthy and vibrant society. Celebrate the nation's creativity or cultural heritage. Facilitate cross-sector collaborations that center the arts at the intersection of other disciplines, sectors, and industries. Contribute to healthy and thriving local, regional, statewide, and national arts ecosystems and arts infrastructures. Invest in organizational capacity building and leadership development for arts organizations, arts workers, and artists. Build arts organizations' capacity to serve a broad public through digital or emerging technology and or support tech-centered creative practices across all artistic disciplines and forms. Originate from or in collaboration with the following constituencies encouraged by White House executive orders. Historically Black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities, American Indian and Alaska Native tribes, predominantly Black institutions, Hispanic serving institutions, Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, and organizations that support the independence and lifelong inclusion of people with disabilities. In February 2023, the agency received 1,996 eligible GAP applications, requesting more than $102.7 million in FY 2024 support. Recommended for the Council's approval are 959 projects, totaling more than $27 million. Grants are recommended to 48% of all applicants, with amounts ranging from $10,000 to $100,000, and an average grant amount of $28,377. Recommended projects span 15 disciplines and fields. Direct grants are recommended to 49 states, Washington, DC, and Puerto Rico. Please mark your ballot. The National Endowment for the Arts provides direct support to creative writers and literary translators of distinction through creative writing fellowships. Fellowships and pros enable recipients to set aside time for writing, research, travel, and general career advancement. Fellowships for translation projects enable recipients to translate work from other languages into English. This year, a total of $875,000 is being recommended to 35 writers in creative writing, pros, and $325,000 to 18 translators to translate works from 12 languages in 16 countries into English. Please mark your ballot. National initiatives support a wide variety of projects of national and field-wide significance. At this meeting, the council is requested to approve funding for 37 projects representing five disciplines, totaling more than $9.8 million. Support is requested for a collaborative public art project that will memorialize the victims of the mass shooting that occurred in Buffalo, New York in May, 2022. Three cooperative agreements in support of the Creative Forces, NEA Military Healing Arts Network, which provides creative arts therapies and arts engagement activities in clinical and community settings for service members, veterans, and families. 10 individuals nominated to receive an NEA National Heritage Fellowship an award that honors American folk and traditional artists for their contributions to traditional art forms and to the American public through their artistic work. The production and management of public events for the National Endowment for the Arts National Heritage Fellowship Program, which annually honors the NEA National Heritage Fellows. A new design and creative placemaking initiative that will support cross-sector teams of artists, culture bearers, and transportation and climate advocates and generating community-engaged arts and design projects that seek to address the negative impacts of streets and highway infrastructure in urban environments. 17 projects 
and National Endowment for the Arts research grants in the arts, which support a broad range of arts-related studies, and three recommended projects in National Endowment for the Arts research labs, including one lab renewal. One of the labs will focus on studying the effects of prior training on the hearing, communication, and psychosocial well-being of people with Alzheimer's disease or who are at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Another NEA research lab will study traditional arts apprenticeship programs and their long-term contributions to folk and traditional arts in this country. The lab renewal will examine the effect on adolescents' creative imagination, curiosity, and cognitive flexibility as a result of sustained arts engagement. Please mark your ballot. Council members, you may now email your votes on those three categories to Kim Jefferson. Finally, we move to the award update section of the council book. These grants have been awarded under the chair's delegated authority and are brought to the council's attention at this meeting, but no vote is necessary. Included are 16 arts engagement and American communities program grants made under the chair's small grant authority, totaling $160,000. One shares extraordinary action award and five interagency agreements. Thank you very much. And I will now turn it over to Chair Jackson. Thank you, Ayana. In the next few minutes, I'll share some updates and insights since our last council meeting in June. But first, a word about Israel and Gaza. Like all of you, I've watched the loss of life unfolding with a heavy heart. At the Arts Endowment, we remain committed to promoting empathy and compassion, to seeing each other's humanity, and to combating anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and other forms of hatred and harm. These are heavy times with horrific mass shootings here as recent as this week, this time in Maine. The work of artists, cultural workers, and cultural organizations matter as we strive to build environments where all people can live in peace and thrive. The last few months have been productive and packed for all of us at the NEA. I've had an opportunity to travel with NEA staff to urban, rural, and tribal communities all across the country. <clears throat> In July, I visited South Dakota for the first time during my term. We spent time in rural areas with tribal nations, including the Pine Ridge Reservation and Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation. We learned about priorities and challenges for those communities and about what it means to work nation to nation. We saw strong evidence of NEA investments helping to make possible the reclamation of indigenous cultures, we also saw how the arts are contributing to efforts focused on health, youth development, and community development. This includes the work of the First Peoples Fund on the Pine Ridge Reservation and Cheyenne River Youth Project on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation. In Rhode Island, we participated in a visit hosted by Senator Jack Reed and his team. We visited a range of cultural organizations and participated in community meetings throughout the state. Senator Sheldon Whitehouse of Rhode Island also joined the trip. Also in July, I traveled to Detroit, Michigan and connected with members of the National Council on the Arts, Ishmael Ahmed and Gretchen Gonzalez Davidson. My visit coincided with the Concert of Colors, Detroit's free annual diversity themed musical festival. It is truly a beloved citywide event and it was wonderful to see our council members in their leadership roles on home turf. I participated in a community conversation at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History presented by Michigan Council for the Arts and Concert of Colors. The session was moderated by museum president, Neil Barclay. While in Detroit, I also spoke with Omari Rush, executive director of Culture Source for an interview with PBS Books. We discussed the transformative power of the arts and its impact on personal well being and community development in Metro Detroit and beyond. In August, at the invitation of colleagues from the National Endowment for the Humanities, I attended a Department of Interior organized event in California focused on Indian boarding schools and forced assimilation per per perpetrated through them. 
This was an opportunity to better understand how the humanities and the arts can play critical roles in healing. Also in August, I visited Santa Fe, New Mexico with NEH Chair Shelley Lowe and our respective teams. We spent time with tribal leaders, indigenous artists, and culture bearers. We also had the opportunity to meet with Secretary of Interior Deb Holland and U.S. Representative Sharice Davids from Kansas. We also met with the Executive Director of the New Mexico State Arts Agency and two of our National Heritage Fellows, 2022 Fellow Eva Encinas and 2023 Fellow Elizabeth James Perry, who was participating in the Santa Fe Indian Market, one of the largest art shows in the country. In addition to touring the Santa Fe Indian Market and learning about how it's organized and how artists experience it, we also visited the Pathways Festival, a concurrent celebration of Native American arts and culture. A particularly unique highlight of the visit to New Mexico was attendance at a 2023 Indigenous fashion show, which was marking its 10th anniversary and spotlighting tremendous skills of Indigenous designers in various, from various parts of North America. In that visit, we were able to learn a bit more about the role of fashion design as an art form that is core to Indigenous identity and the reclamation and advancement of culture. Thank you to Council Member Bitta Becker for generously sharing her time with us during our visit to the Institute of American Indian Arts, where we heard about their work fostering creativity and leadership. In Maine, we were hosted by Congresswoman Shelley Pingree. We visited with the governor, arts administrators, artists, educators, and community leaders in urban and several rural communities. Representative Pingree was proud to share with us how the arts and arts organizations play important roles in the various places we visited as economic anchors, as hubs that help welcome new residents in Maine, and as entities that bolster pride and stewardship of place and more. As was the case in Rhode Island, there was robust discussion about the roles of the arts in relation to public health. Last month, I was very pleased to participate in the 74th meeting of the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities in Washington, DC. About a year ago, President Biden signed an executive order that reestablished and renewed the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities. The committee is co-chaired by Lady Gaga and Bruce Cohen and comprised of leading artists, scholars, museum practitioners, and philanthropists ready to support the arts and humanities as vehicles for positive change. Congratulations to Tsion Wold Michael, the executive director of PCAH on the first meeting of the newly formed committee. Earlier this month, I visited Guanajuato, Mexico for the Festival Internacional Cervantino, where the United States was recognized as a country of honor. The NEA was especially proud to support a cultural exchange among students from Dancing Grounds, an organization, an organization from New Orleans, Louisiana, and Semillero Creativo de Danza Urbana from Epalme, Sonora in Mexico. Together, the students choreographed a piece that premiered at the festival. The effort was an important opportunity for cultural exchange among young people. And just this week in Washington, I was pleased to give a keynote at Build Rural, the 2023 National Rural Housing Conference hosted by the Housing Assistance Council and the NEA's partner on the Citizens Institute on Rural Design. In that keynote, I underscored the range of ways that the arts and good design can help build communities where all people can thrive. So what have I heard during these travels? It was significant to see how the NEA shows up in these communities, often providing seminal support at critical junctures in the careers of artists and trajectories of cultural organizations. People recall receiving support with great appreciation, often citing that support as catalytic. There continues to be great gratitude for ARP support during the pandemic, data provided about the state of the sector and appreciation for convenings and connections made possible with or through the NEA. I'm especially proud when I hear accolades as I often do for staff, as people express their appreciation for staff accessibility and support. Throughout my travels, I heard loud and clear that many artists and arts organizations are continuing to feel pain in this post-pandemic landscape. 
While COVID no longer poses the same constraints as it has in the past, we've heard from grantees and particularly from performing arts organizations that audience attendance is still down. And of course, this has impact on so many more in other realms, including employment, facilities, and beyond. Many organizations are scaling back in size and ambition. Some institutions are laying off staff and others are closing doors. In New York this summer, I met and listened to arts labor union leaders. We've seen arts workers across the country take to the streets and picket lines for fair wages, sustainable work practices, and safe working conditions. I've heard from a number of artists and creative workers about rising concerns around artificial intelligence the need to safeguard legal rights for artists, as well as understand the range of complex issues that come with AI. National conversations about how to strengthen the performing arts sector and how to address the complex issue that is AI are necessary and the NEA is committed to helping create the national platforms where those important exchanges can happen. I've also heard about ways we can continue to bolster our efforts to be accessible and to meet organizations where they are, especially small organizations with few staff that are often stretched. It was clear that NEA remains a vital source of support for our nation's arts ecosystems and for cultural organizations of all disciplines, all budget sizes, and from all parts of the country. People sent a clear message that the work of the NEA matters now more than ever, and we continue to work to ensure that we are relevant, nimble, and maximally impactful as a grant maker and as a national resource. Since I've held this position, I've been advancing the importance of all people having the opportunity to live artful lives. Artful lives is an inclusive concept and it includes a range of activity from the everyday aesthetic choices and practices that we pursue, often as non-professional creative people, making, doing, teaching, learning, to the creation, presentation, and consumption of professional art. It includes artistic disciplines like music, theater, and visual arts, as well as other realms that we've paid less attention to, like fashion and culinary arts. The NEA contributes to opportunities for artful lives through our support of thousands of different kinds of arts and arts-related projects in urban and rural communities throughout the country. Our grants help make possible the full expression of our diverse nation. Today, we're going to hear about important facets of Artful Lives and the ways the Arts Endowment is honoring our nation's creators and culture bearers, including a focus on the NEA's National Heritage Fellows, who are critical to the preservation and continuance of cultural knowledge and traditions. Today, we'll also examine two new NEA research reports which track arts participation in the US and help us understand important trends and evolutions. Another concept I've been advancing as chair is the importance of the work at the intersection of arts and other fields, such as health, community development, education, transportation, among others. One thing I know for sure is that none of the things that we aspire to as a nation of opportunity and justice are possible without the intentional integration of arts, culture, and humanities into all facets of our lives and the systems we rely on to care for each other. At their best, the arts don't exist only in isolation. They also work with and through other sectors to maximize their impacts. Consistent with President Biden's executive order on cultural vitality, the NEA is bolstering collaborations and partnerships with other federal agencies encouraging cross-sectoral collaborations in state and local levels as well, helping others do their best work by integrating arts and culture into all facets of our lives, and also unlocking new additional opportunities for artists and arts organizations who wish to assert and contribute in this way. As we celebrate National Arts and Humanities Month and mark the one-year anniversary of President Biden's executive order on cultural vitality, the NEA is advancing foundational work for a national arts and culture integration strategy. For us at the NEA, this means strengthening and refining longstanding existing work in collaboration with other federal agencies and external partners, 
and also establishing a new Office of Partnerships, Innovation, and Expansion. On Tuesday, October 17th, the NEA partnered with the White House Domestic Policy Council to host a meeting with federal agency heads, congressional members, and arts and culture leaders, as well as leaders from philanthropy on the roles of the arts and humanities in strengthening our nation. Administration officials across sectors, including health, transportation, infrastructure, and education, discussed ways the arts and culture contribute to goals such as equitable community engagement, social connectedness, mental health, and climate resilience in rural and urban settings. I'm excited about where this work is headed, including a new cross-agency working group on arts, health, and infrastructure that Secretary Becerra and I will co-chair. Secretary Becerra from the Health and Human Services. This recent meeting at the White House will help inform this recent meeting at the White House will help inform a planned summit at the NEA offices and available as live stream. The summit is entitled Healing, Bridging, Thriving, a summit on arts and culture in our communities. The event will take place on January 30th, 2024. During the summit, we'll feature a bold new narrative about the roles of the arts in our communities and advance a comprehensive arts integration strategy. The summit will generate attention and knowledge about the importance of the arts, including its roles in strengthening work with, in particular with health defined very holistically, local infrastructure understood as physical and social, and in relation to equitable outcomes. The summit will also address new opportunities for artists and cultural organizations interested in contributing at these intersections. Performances, panel discussions, and keynotes will help to form a vision for, for how the arts and artists can help us address these areas and unlock new opportunities. So please stay tuned for more details about the summit by following our social media and checking our website. And now we have a couple of presentations on recent NEA work. At the end of September, the NEA hosted a historic one-day gathering of National Heritage Fellowship honorees from 2020 to 2023, including a special afternoon panel featuring film screenings and a conversation about native art making in the land. This was co-presented with the National Museum of the American Indian. Embedded in their communities and often regarded as leaders who are the keepers and teachers of meaningful traditions, NEA National Heritage Fellows are the epitome of living an artful life. Now, to tell us a little more about the fellows and this historic gathering, I present Acting Director of Folk and Traditional Arts, Cheryl Sheely. Thank you, Chair Jackson, and good morning, everyone. My name is Cheryl Sheely. I'm a Black woman with my hair in braids, wearing a royal blue top, and I wear eyeglasses. I'm very pleased to be with you today, and I'm excited to present a slideshow on our most recent National Heritage Fellowships events. Since 1982, the NEA National Heritage Fellowships has elevated the visibility of exemplary folk and traditional artists. Their contributions to our nation's cultural heritage illuminate human resiliency, carry over many generations through their songs, dances, stories, rituals, and cultural practices. The fellows communicate from one generation to the next that our past meets the present and shows us a pathway to the future. This year marked the, a return to in-person events in Washington, DC after three years of virtual programming due to the COVID-19 pandemic. When our in-person festivities paused, we produced in-depth films in their place. The films took us on a tour across the country with the 2020, 2021, and 2022 National Heritage Fellows. For this landmark occasion, we brought together all four classes from 2020 to 2023 for an historic gathering and celebration. On September 28th, we convened a day-long event called Gathering and Fellowship, the Legacy and Impact of National Heritage Fellows. The gathering provided an opportunity for fellows 
to collectively reflect on the impact of the award. And on Friday, September 29th, we recommenced our award ceremony to formally honor the 2023 class and formally recognize the 2020 to 2022 fellows. The planning for our time together with our cooperator, the National Council for the Traditional Arts, was designed with input from the fellows and with their interests in mind. When I reflect on what emerged, three themes come to mind. The fellows, their family, friends, and guests had a chance to connect and build a rapport with one another, share and learn from each other, and uplift and celebrate together. Held at the, National, at, held at the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, the gathering began with a rousing opening with 2022 recipients Excelsior Band of Mobile, Alabama, an historic brass marching band which was established in 1883. They kicked off the day and introduced themselves, bringing the sounds of Mobile, Alabama to us. In this first session, following opening remarks by Chair Jackson and myself, each fellow continued with introductions by sharing a welcoming practice. They spoke to and embodied how one would welcome someone into their tradition, whether it was a song, a chant, or a simple morning greeting. Coined the national sharing of culture, this facilitated sharing circle filled the auditorium with wondrous moments of storytelling and gratitude, towed through both tears and laughter. After setting the intention for the day, 41 individuals, six facilitators, and three note takers enter, entered into small group discussions around two topics, ancestry and voices, the people we honor, and legacy and impact of receiving a National Heritage Fellowship. They discussed the influential people in their lives and careers, their mentors, and the support systems that brought them to where they are today. Many talked about their families, close friends and community members, and connections to place, land, food, and community resources, including local radio stations playing music of the region, libraries, parks, historic buildings, and places of worship. When discussing the impacts of receiving this award, many remarked on how special the, firm, the films were in absence of in-person gathering and having something to share with others. And that the news coverage of the award offered a platform to delve deeply into the importance of their work to a wider audience. And for some, it provided an unexpected dimension to many years of work. Luis Tapia is a sculptor in the Hispano wood carving tradition, which you may recognize as saint carving. Tapia's sculptures vibrantly tell thought-provoking stories of his community, including themes of social injustice. When asked what receiving this award meant to him, he responded in this way. And I believe we have a video here that we'll go to. It's kind of overwhelming because, you know, I didn't get into sculpting uh, for awards. That was the last thing in my mind. I mean, we're talking about 50 years of carving. So that was never an aspect or a thought that I would be getting anything as an, an award. And uh, to be recognized like this is, uh, it, it is overwhelming. And, and to realize that there's people out there who nominated you that you weren't even prepared for so that's like a second gift knowing that these people are there behind you supporting you and you not knowing anything about it so it, it sort of snuck up on you but it's a real important uh, uh, place to be for me right now especially after you know working for 50 years it's just kind of overwhelming because Following the small group sessions, we went into a presentation that was open to the public and co-presented by the National Museum of the American Indian. It included a film screening and a panel discussion on Native art making in the land. Eight Native fellowship recipients shared firsthand stories of how place and belonging uh, 
is important to their life's work. After a day-long demonstration of how different cultures share common threads, on Friday, the fellows took center stage. Open to the public and often covered by the press, our official award ceremony was hosted by the Library of Congress and the American Folk Life Center. The 2023 fellows received their medals from Chair Jackson in the library's ornate Thomas Jefferson Building across from the US Capitol. On three occasions this year, members of Congress joined the chair on stage to present the award to their esteemed constituents. Congressman Derek Kilmer of Washington for Ed Eugene Carrier, Susquamish, Congresswoman Jill Takuda of Hawaii for Rowan Kalevai Hufford, Native Hawaiian, and Congresswoman Teresa Legere Fernandez of New Mexico for Luis Tapia. In our final artful moments of the evening, Wu Man and the legendary increments gave spirited performances for guests and supporters at the awards reception. There is a lot to be learned from our time together, and we will undertake a closer look at the proceedings for a future report. I'd like to share some initial key takeaways. It is clear that receiving national recognition is validation for hard work, which can sometimes feel underappreciated. It uplifts messages that heritage arts can bring, ideas around social cohesion or the environment, and it encourages continuity of traditions. Tagumpai Mendoza de Leon is a performer and beloved teacher of Rondalia, a unique string ensemble that performs traditional Filipino music for gatherings. Its development in the Filipino diasporic community in the United States has flourished under his leadership. He noted, I am not a Facebook user, but after the announcement, my Facebook page was full of congratulations. I had more people sending me friend requests from all over the world than I had friends. I am very grateful for all the Rondali musicians all over the world. We have been on the sidelines for so long. Wayne Valier is a birch bark canoe builder from Lac de Flambeau Ojibwe Nation in Lac de Flambeau, Wisconsin. His mentorship of others encompasses indigenous language preservation, traditional canoe building, and the environment. When responding to how the awards news coverage made an impact, he remarked, it led us to be able to spread other messages. And my message is clean water. It has allowed us to get the message to the world. Rowan Kahalevai Hufford is a knowledge keeper of Kahana Kappa, or making bark cloth. She's also the daughter of a 1990 National Heritage Fellow, Marie Lealua McDonald. Together, they work to document and present Hawaiian traditions and values, and Rowan is a farmer and cultivator of the land. Her recognition shines brightly and encourages her students. She noted, when I tell other makers that this honor had been bestowed upon me, it validates what they do too. My students are pleased, are so pleased that I am here because it recognizes them as well. Let's hear from Pipa performer Hu Man, a musician who has performed with renowned groups from uh, groups like the Silk Road Ensemble and Kronos Quartet. And she's used her platform to bridge cultures with a centuries old Chinese instrument. You know, Pipa is with a, with a very long history and uh, we have all the traditional music, but what's going to next generation? What are they gonna do? And how they gonna carry on this tradition and move forward? That's another challenge for, for my generation, for myself. And uh, is it gonna change or is it gonna keep exactly? And I'm sure my teacher will say, you already changed. <laughs> so I think in, in that way, I, it's a health, healthy way. Um, we learn the tradition, but also in living in the modern days, Many fellows remarked that being together with so many fellow honorees was an extraordinary experience. 
Their embrace of one another confirmed that collective cultural understanding and appreciation for deeper connections and positive developments in the furtherance of cultural traditions. I am grateful to the fellows for their knowledge keeping gifts to the nation and for their trust in us. Thank you also to the many colleagues who helped to make this a successful event. For those who are interested, the award ceremony was live streamed for the first time and you can watch it at arts.gov heritage. Thank you and I'd be happy to take questions from the council. Chair Jackson. Cheryl, will there be opportunities in the future for the fellows to gather? It sounds like it was a very meaningful experience for them. Yes, I would say there are a number of, of key takeaways from our uh, time together, um, which is engagement, uh, further engagement and networking. Uh, C. Brian Williams, who uh, is a step artist and producer, um, you may know him from Step Africa. Uh, when he was in conversation with everyone at the small group uh, sessions, he noted, is everyone on social media? I want everyone's contact information. They really uh, were taken with being able to have conversations like this about cultural traditions with one another. Um, concretely, we want to continue the conversation with older classes of fellows. Um, from those classes that are before 2019. And, and so uh, we will do this virtually um, and over the winter and in the early spring months. We hope that these conversations, both the gathering and those virtually, will help inform a report that will share observations and recommendations. Thanks for that. Any other questions or comments for Cheryl from Council? Let's see. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you. Next up is Sunil Iyengar, Director of the NEA's Office of Research and Analysis. To, uh, he will discuss two reports we released last week, Arts Participation Patterns in 2022, which highlights the most recent survey of public participation in the arts, and online audiences for arts programming, a survey of virtual participation amid COVID-19, which explores findings from the 2022 General Social Survey. Sunil, please join us. Thank you very much, Dr. Jackson. And hello, council members. Good morning, everyone. Uh, as you heard, my name is Sunil Iyengar, uh, Director of the Office of Research and Analysis. I'm wearing a uh, blue jacket, I guess you would call it steel blue, uh, with a yellow shirt and a red and blue tie, and I've got a black, and I got gla I have wear glasses, and I've got a black background with the NEA logo on it. So I am eager to share with you results from uh, two major surveys we ran last year in partnership with other federal agencies. Both tell us something new about how Americans experienced arts activities between the second and third year of the pandemic, when arts and entertainment venues were starting to open up again, and we were well into the post-vaccine period. The results were posted to arts.gov just last week in the form of two publications. One is a research report with highlights from the Survey of Public Participation in the Arts, or the SPPA. This is our flagship survey for measuring arts participation patterns nationwide. We've conducted it roughly every five years since 1982, working with the U.S. Census Bureau. The second document is a research brief based on arts-related question items in the general social survey, which we supported last year through a partnership with the National Science Foundation. The brief is called Online Audiences for Arts Programming, a survey of virtual participation amid COVID-19. So I'm gonna spend the majority of time here talking about results from the first survey, which was conducted in July, 2022. Respondents were asked to think back to the previous 12-month period and report on their participation in a variety of arts activity types. The total sample size for the survey exceeded 40,000 adults, that's 18 and older. Results are nationally representative. Next slide, please. 
More, uh, the, the first main finding in the report is that over half of all adults, 52% or 129 million people, did some type of art making themselves, personally creating or performing art in the 2022 survey year. This is roughly comparable to the share we found that did art making five years earlier in 2017, though we used slightly different question items that time around. I wanna show you just how this 52% stacks up when we consider the other ways people engage with the arts. From top to bottom, these bars represent the percentages of adults who did at least one type of arts activity, starting with the category consuming art via electronic or digital media. As you can see, the lion's share of adults did this in 2022, 75%, which is again comparable to the figure we got five years earlier uh, in 2017 using slightly different questions. The next greatest share of adults participating in the arts were those who read works of literature or books of any type, 53% of all adults. Roughly the same share personally created or performed art as seen in the red box there. Next, you have the share of adults who attended arts events in person, followed by the share who learned an art form or subject as an adult. Next slide. So let's just scratch the surface to see what kinds of art making folks were up to in 21-22. Um, today, you heard Chair Jackson talk about the concept of artful lives, how arts and culture are integral to Americans' everyday lived experiences of making, doing, teaching, and learning. Well, not only did most adults do some kind of art making in 2022, uh, they did certain activities at higher rates than the last time we took these measures. Some of the activities that increased were in arts and crafts. Uh, fitting, we just heard about the Heritage Awards. Um, what might be considered largely at-home activities leatherwork, metalwork, or woodwork, and working with textiles. But we also saw musical instrument playing, and two activities, despite taking a dip between 2017 and 2020, were back up in 2022, taking photos as an artistic activity and creative writing. By contrast, for a couple of activities, we saw declines in creating and performing art. These included singing, whether alone in a social gathering or in a group or choir, and performing or practicing dance. So um, the section of the survey for which we have the best long-term trend data is a series of questions about attending arts events in person. This is a topic that obviously has attracted lots of attention in the media and trade press over the last several months. How have attendance rates fared in the wake of COVID-19? Our survey finds that the overall rate of arts attendance, that is the percent of US, US adults who attended any kind of visual or performing arts event dropped by nearly six percentage points in 2022 compared with five years earlier. To show you what I mean, here are three time points, 2012, 17, and 22. You can see that after rising slightly over the first five-year period to 54% of adults who attended at least one arts event in person, we saw a decrease in 2022 to 48%, which is less than both the 12 and 17 levels. Now, if we look only at the visual art activities people attended, we see that for visiting art museums or galleries, that top row, there was a six point drop, similar to the share who in 2022 went to a crafts fair or a visual arts festival. Um, and it's not on here, but the rate of movie, movie going also fell uh, by about 26%. But just so you understand how to read this table, the gray shaded area tells you the percentage point difference from 2017 to 2022, and then how steep that change was. Take a look at the third row. This is the share of people who toured or visited a park, building, monument, or neighborhood because it was a place of historic or design interest. Although the share doing this activity did dip in 22, it wasn't by much, only by two percentage points. Ostensibly, most of those activities were outdoors. I'll get back to this later. In-person attendance at performing arts activities, on the other hand, saw much sharper declines as a whole, virtually across the board, whether it was jazz, Latin Spanish salsa music, musical plays, ballet, or outdoor performing arts festivals. Uh, in particular, or even other dance, non-ballet dance. In particular, I want to note that the apparent audience for opera events, 2.2% of all adults in 2017 lost two thirds of its share in 2022, while the attendance rate for non-musical plays was halved, as was the rate for attending, as, as I said, alluded to dance performances that weren't ballet. Which brings us to that bottom row in gray, this was the only arts attendance activity which in 2022 saw a decided increase. 
That year, more than 21% of adults versus 15% in 2017 attended an activity or event that falls into a category we call other performing arts. This category covers a range of performing arts activity types we don't expressly ask about. It may have included rock, pop, rap, hip hop, country music, and other commercially viable art forms. It also may have included comedy, improv, magic shows, circus acts, or other forms of arts and entertainment that didn't fit neatly into the buckets of attendance we asked about. Maybe a range of informal arts activities. So you can bet we'll want to dig deeper through research to learn what all the category entails. The survey also tells us that open air facilities, parks, pavilions, and amphitheaters were among the most popular places for attending arts events in 2022, which may not be surprising given the reluctance of many people to be together in tightly closed spaces during the pandemic. We also found that social media and communications from friends, neighbors, or coworkers were the most commonly cited ways for people to learn about the arts events they chose to attend. So we've talked so far about art making and arts attendance. Reading is, of course, another way to participate in the arts. What's striking here is one would have thought that, or might have thought that during the pandemic, people would gravitate to long-term reading. Well, reading of books in general and novels and short stories in particular has continued on a downward trajectory as expressed by the percentage of adults who read now versus five or 10 years ago. So if you look at people who said they read any book not required for work or school, and they didn't have to finish the whole thing and they could have read it online or you know, in print, so to speak, that number slipped a little in 2017 from 2012, but now is down further to fewer than half of all adults. Similarly, look at the shares of adults who read in various genres in each of the last five-year intervals. For poetry reading, we saw an uptick in 2017 that was talked about in the news and social media. Then in 2022, the rate receded a little, though it's still greater than the 2012 poetry reading rate. Yet with novels and short stories, the decline has been marked throughout. We are now down to 38%, which is the lowest rate we've had for this category in the history of the SPPA. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip some findings we have about arts consumption via electronic or digital media. I just wanted to note again that by, it's by far the most common way people report engaging with the arts. Uh, but the SPPA also asked questions about how adults engage with learning in the arts. It may not be a surprise given technology, but most people who did this were not reliant on classes or lessons to learn an arts subject. Remember, we're talking about an adult, adults. Most who did arts learning either taught themselves, perhaps with the help of online resources or videos, but also by learning from friends or family or as part of a family tradition. This latter possibility emphasizes the social dimension of the arts, again, what Cher Jackson calls uh, artful lives. For my remaining time, I'll shift gears and give you highlights from, for this, from the second survey we conducted, the General Social Survey or GSS supported by the National Science Foundation. We funded the creation of an arts module for this questionnaire. Like the SPPA, it asks respondents to consider a 12 month period before the survey took place which was in the summer of 2022. Uh, the sample size here is much, much smaller than the SPPA, but responses were weighted to reflect the general population of adults. So for this survey, we focused on understanding how virtual arts participation fared in the pandemic, specifically uh, virtual arts programming. We found that the total share of adults, 82% who engaged with arts events through digital media, was not too far off the 75% noted through our other survey, the SPPA. But we asked about different types of activity from that survey. Here you see that the greatest share of adults, 69% attended web archived performing arts events, followed by 43% attending live stream performing arts events in 22. We also found that 30% of all survey respondents said they were now attending these virtual arts activities more often than in year one of the pandemic from March, 2020 to 2021. I wanna add that another key finding from this brief is that several demographic subgroups that historically have seen lower in-person attendance rates than other groups in 2022 showed exceptionally high rates of virtual arts attendance. 18 to, 12, 18 to 24 year olds, so the youngest adults, but also Hispanics, Blacks, and African Americans and others who showed higher participation rates than whites. They also reported doing these activities more often than in the first year of the pandemic. So taking the results from both surveys, although they're a mixed bag, I do think we have some positive directions to explore. 
One, as we saw for several art forms, the percentage of people creating and performing art has in increased over the most recent survey period. When it comes to attendance, although we saw severe drops for most event types, the rate of visiting places for historic or design value has held relatively stable. This is consistent with the finding that outdoor venues were among the most popular for arts attendance in 2022. We also saw that attendance actually went up for performing arts events that fell outside the categories we asked about. These may have been blockbuster events such as stadium or arena filling concerts, uh, just as people were starting to get out more. Uh, but they also could have been arts activities reflecting different genres or cultural traditions than we ask about. So we need to consider this finding as we make revisions to the survey for future rounds. Also, social media and peer-to-peer -peer communications are now the most common ways people learn about arts events they choose to attend. Finally, in the area of virtual arts participation, it turns out that the youngest adults, as well as what the survey refers to as non-white groups, Hispanic or Latino or non-white and non-Hispanic groups, subpopulations which in the past have seen lower rates of in-person arts attendance, are now among the groups most likely to attend virtual arts events, and these groups reported doing so more often than in the first year of the pandemic. So what are we doing with all this information? Uh, next year, we'll be producing a comprehensive statistical report of the SPPA findings, covering a lot more demographic data, but also arts and cultural activities we haven't discussed today. The chair mentioned culinary activities. We have a question about that. It's like there's an app for that. There's a question for that on the SPPA and for other arts and cultural forms. Um, we'll also perform a state-by-state -state analysis to understand how participation patterns vary across the U.S. And also, we'll try to better understand the arts relationships to civic and social engagement. We want these numbers to fit into a national conversation about arts and cultural activities in the U.S. And indeed, what it means to participate and for whom. We've commi we're commissioning a short symposia of papers from artists, critics, culture bearers, and arts administrators and others. As I said earlier, we're taking some of these findings to retool components of the SPPA so that question items are more in line with contemporary realities about how people engage with the arts. But we also want to maintain the ability to monitor long-term trend lines wherever possible. And finally, perhaps most importantly of all, we will do our best to feed this information into the workflow of the NEA programmatically when it comes to understanding and addressing gaps in access to arts and cultural experiences as reflected by statistics for historically underserved groups. In closing, I want to thank our team, including especially Melissa Menzer and Patricia Mullaney Loss, our lead analysts and authors for these reports and Kelly Rogowski and Liz O'Claire in our Office of Public Affairs. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil. Uh, one question, can you elaborate uh, a bit on implications specifically as it pertains to addressing underserved communities? Yes, well, as you know, uh, Chair Jackson, uh, we've, we've developed, the NEA has developed partly in response to a presidential order, an equity action plan, which has several components on our website, including the use of research and data to understand what barriers have existed, not only for arts participation itself, but for arts programming that the NEA supports. Um, and so we're actually, one of the planks of that plan is we are working now with six regional, organ, regional arts organizations on the development of a new initiative that will invest in the work of organizations as, uh, that, that sort of um, organizations that particularly have uh, focused on serving historically underrepresented groups and have good practices. So we'll work on supporting those organizations through our regional arts organization partners. Um, and these are, again, organizations with a commitment to equity in their practices and programming. And this initiative will include capacity building grants, learning opportunities and network building, um, and it also will have, there will be key research coming out of it to inform for future practice. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to hopefully we'll, we'll have details soon that everybody can explore and we'd love to talk further about that. Thank you for that, Sunil. Any more questions for Sunil from council? I, I had a question and it was just probably around a, a little bit more clarity. Um, in, in the first survey, you, you stated that there's um, uh, one of the categories that you stated was the other category, which had a significant number of um, contemporary music, pop, rock, as well as, um, you know, other types of genres. And those were significant numbers of, I think, participation in the arts. And my question is, is there any consideration for an expansion of the categories under which the data that you're collecting 
um, um, moving forward, seeing as those those numbers yes. were so significant. Yes, and I'll say that you know this. Many people know this survey is sort of a historical uh, anchor kind of survey, and so it's gone on for many many years, and we've modified it over the years. Uh, but the arts participation questions, and particularly around attendance, as you note. Um, we've always had this sort of catch-all category, and we don't know what's in that. We're speculating it could have been most logically it makes sense, some of the art forms we mentioned there. Um, and again, it was 21% of adults who did those things. Uh, but in the past, we haven't seen this increase. There's such a dramatic increase. And this, if anything, certainly uh, prompts us to want to expand the categories and find a way of doing that and still retaining trend data on the, on the because every time you change a survey question, as you know, probably, it rejiggers a little bit of what you're able to track historically. Um, but we still want to get at these new art forms. And so we're going to be doing some qualitative research to understand. I mean, intuitively, I think we, we can yeah, put down some of those art forms, but we want to have a better sense proportionally of which art forms we should include. And, and we don't want to exclude anything too. So we want to be very open there and yet, you know, understanding the budget and real estate of the survey instrument itself. I hope that's helpful. But no, yes, absolutely. the answer is a yes. Absolutely. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. And I see Deepa has her hand up. Hi, Sunil. Thank you very much uh, for sobering, but also somewhat exciting report. I had a follow on actually to the last question. One was I, the decline in reading. Did that include audiobooks or was it simply actual reading of, of different publications and materials? And then the second question is a little bit related to the category shift. Have we ever worked in concert with private sector entities that produce this and obviously are also tracking consumption as a way to think about sort of the cultural fabric of the country and share information across the groups to get a better sense of what's happening in terms of people's uh, arts participation? Yes, great question. So the reading question, um, actually that does not include audiobook reading. Uh, when we look at the share of people who read or did audiobooks, it did decline as a total, as an aggregate from last time around. However, when you look at audiobooks only, people doing audiobooks, whether they read or not in the other way, um, it actually went up slightly from 16.5% of people reading audiobook or listening to audiobooks in 2017 to 18.5% in, uh, in 2022. Uh, so again, these are indicators we need to be aware of other ways people are participating and how to track them as in our top line numbers and also to promote what people are actually doing. So we've had some great conversations so far with Amy Stoll's literary arts director on this. And I will say, um, and we're going to be talking with the field about it, the comment about uh, commercial and other ways of tracking consumption. Absolutely. We actually, even with our federal partners, Bureau of Labor Statistics, we look at things like time use uh, spent in the arts, but outside the federal uh, government, um, we've been tracking a lot of the commercial surveys and nonprofit and academic surveys around this and trying to, and you know, our, the research teams for these organizations meet periodically. Um, there, was, there was a major survey that, for example, came out during the pandemic, uh, you may be aware of, that uh, tracked uh, cultural participation. And the, the makers of that survey are people we, we definitely talk to uh, re relatively frequently with other survey groups as well. Thank you, Thank you. Christopher. Thanks so much for this um, really useful data. I'm just curious if there are any questions currently um, that talk or inquire more about um, venues. Uh, there was definitely some great data about outdoor venues that I think is very helpful, but I'm curious about like size, type of venue, et cetera. That's a great question. So we didn't get into size, but we do have a list of other types of venues. And um, you know, some of the other venues, of course, places of worship, we track that. So we can tell not only for what, what uh, demographic group attended that, but we can look at how frequently people attended arts activities and whether they saw them in those kinds of places. Um, also, uh, you know, other kinds of community centers. And uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember all of them, but in addition to outdoors and, and, and um, also I think schools, and other kinds of venues that they may have seen art work in. Because again, trying to get more of the community root level participation beyond going into grand performing arts hall or um, a, a museum on a hill. Thank you. Fiona? I think you're on mute. That was, that was really uh, fascinating. I could have listened to more of that. I noted that social media and the internet were really important 
um, methods of, of dispersing information and drawing people in. And I just wonder if any of your work in the surveys looks at the availability of broadband, um, the demographics of those who have easier access to broadband, et cetera, and how that well, fits this, that narrative. That's a great question. And I know our media arts director, Jax DeLuca, is passionate about that. And I will say this ties in, again, this closes the loop in a way. And what uh, Dr. Jackson asked about with equity and underserved populations, that is indeed a key variable we're using to overlay on all kinds of data including, we hope, this data, um, but certainly even our grant-making data to understand where communities, which communities are low, bro don't have access to broadband, and how do they, how does, how do, what kinds of intensity of arts participation do we see from our survey, but also through our funding? Uh, how does it, how is it related to those groups? So that's still a work in progress, but absolutely, especially given what the findings showed about how, many, how um, important these means of participation are to groups that may not have other access to other resources if they do have access to uh, the internet and can engage with these art forms. So um, we're gonna continue to mine that data. And I think that puts it up on the agenda for us. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Shmiel? Yeah, could you talk a bit more about why outdoor participation grew? I mean, I know uh, less COVID is part of it, but there seems to be other reasons as well. Yeah, I think the knee-jerk response is because of COVID, but you know what, I will say this, we've done a study a while back, we did a study a while back about outdoor performing arts festivals, and we learned a lot. We learned, among other things, that there's something about um, the interactive or engagement, interactivity, let's say, of, of, of people and artists that's possible in open spaces a lot of times, I'm not talking necessarily about one of those big uh, open air rock concerts or something, which could be the case, but maybe more of a festival atmosphere or a place where people can um, can can uh, mix more freely. You know, oftentimes you can bring your family. It's it's you know, there's a little bit more. Um, you know, I don't always like this distinction. But let's say formal versus informal. It's a little more informal, it, to, to put it that way, and that may in fact be more welcoming to some groups. Uh, so that's something we need to look into more. But I'm thinking back to that study we did a few years ago and linking it up with this. I think it's something that we need to explore because it may be here to stay. There may be more recognition of the power of uh, programming outdoors and also the technical considerations for that. Thank you. Thank you, Sunil, and thank you, Council, for, for that discussion. Uh, and now, as the final piece of business, I'm pleased to announce that the National Council on the Arts has reviewed the applications presented and that a tally of the council members' ballots revealed that all recommendations for funding and rejection have passed. Thank you to the council and our presenters today. Thank you to all the NEA staff who worked so hard to prepare for and execute this meeting. Our next council meeting will be held in person in Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, on March 26th and 27th, 2024. We hope that you will follow the work of the NEA on social media and engage with the important work the agency is supporting in your communities nationwide. The 2011th meeting of the National Council on the Arts is now adjourned. Thank you.